Cognition, an Introduction to Cognitive Science, Heuristics and Biases, by Benjamin Miss. Errors in Thinking The original, groundbreaking work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky changed not just the study of cognition, but also the study of economics. Kahneman was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for the work he did with Tversky, and Tversky would have shared it if he had not passed away before the prize was awarded. We're talking about heuristics and biases, which are natural cognitive processes. Many are related, and the descriptions at time may seem to overlap. Tversky and Kahneman's influential work demonstrated that people are naturally irrational, and that to understand human behavior, we must understand the reasons for irrational thinking. This makes sense. We absorb so much data on a daily basis, we cannot possibly give a careful analysis to all of it. What we do is use mental shortcuts that allow us to take incomplete evidence and make quick and often good decisions. Sometimes, however, these heuristics and biases lead us to make poor decisions. In Kahneman's excellent book, he writes about what he calls System 1 and System 2, a fast automatic system and a slower analytical system. These systems sound similar to William James's substantive and transitive thought, and Kahneman argues that we spend more of our time in the undirected, unfocused thinking of his System 1 than in the focused and thoughtful System 2. Perhaps Kahneman and Tversky's greatest impact was in the study of investing in financial markets, where they demonstrated that people give more consideration to potential losses than to potential gains, even when the potential gains are far greater than the potential losses. For instance, he showed that many people are reluctant to take a gamble that would cost $100 if you lose, but gain 200 if you win. Logically, we should be excited about a gamble that offers those kinds of odds, but many people who wouldn't go hungry if they lost $100 focus more on that fear of loss than on the opportunity of gain. And yet many of those same people are seduced by the flashing lights and harmonious bells of a casino. Even though we can see the problems that heuristics and biases cause, their time-saving benefits have a great deal of application. Many decisions are not worth much of our time, and heuristics allow us to make quick decisions rather than considering all of the pros and cons. The question, should I wear a blue shirt or green shirt today, is not something that deserves the same amount of consideration as the question, should I marry this person? For the sake of efficiency, modern computer science builds heuristics into decision-making algorithms in order to lessen the computational burden. This means that heuristics have a benefit, but also a cost. When heuristics and biases help us make optimal decisions while reducing the cognitive burden, they are beneficial. When these same processes lead to suboptimal decisions, they are harmful. Sometimes, what we gain in saving time, we lose in accuracy. As we look at a sample of heuristics and biases, you may find some difficult to understand. You are not alone. The challenge here is to push through what we think we know so we can understand how we think, and how our incorrect thinking harms us. There are a lot of misconceptions about thinking, and as you are likely aware, pulp culture in the media often misunderstands scientific observations and theories. Knowing that much of our thinking is wrong is certainly not a pleasant thought, but it is true. Your thinking, as well as my thinking, is filled with errors. Kahneman System 1, which is our fast automatic thinking, causes a lot of these errors. Prejudices and snap judgments reside there. We don't think about most things. For instance, most of us have a morning routine that doesn't require thought. We make judgments based on cognitive ease, which is basically mental laziness. Political sound baits prey on System 1, knowing we will agree with things that are not true as long as they fit our belief system and we rarely take the time to consider the source and validity of information that we scroll through on a social media feed, blithely wasting our time and filling our minds with adv advertiser-sponsored rubbish. Very little of what we do is thoughtful and considered, requiring the effort that Kahneman calls System 2. Advisor advertisers and political operatives know this, taking advantage of our 
are prejudices and lazy thinking. Kahneman and Tversky influenced economics through their study of investing and financial decision making. As noted earlier, we show a greater loss aversion than we do excitement over potential gains. Kahneman and Tversky studied fund managers, who are people that oversee the investing of millions of dollars of other people's money. Remember, Kahneman and Tversky found an overabundance of caution in the average person, but these fund managers were wildly overconfident in their abilities. Average people tended to be so risk-averse that even when the odds were in their favor, they could not let go of the fear of loss. They would focus on the short-term dips in the market rather than the long-term rises over time. The fund managers, however, even when presented with evidence that showed they underperformed the market, still held on to their belief that their superior knowledge was responsible for making money for their clients. This work helped Kahneman and Dabersky change economic models by letting go of the assumption that people were making rational decisions. As we see in our chapter on evolutionary psychology, our mind has been influenced by our human past, and understanding modern national and global market forces is not something humans have adapted for. We must also consider that heuristics and biases are part of those mental constructs of mind that were influenced by our evolutionary past functions of mind that helped us survive in an environment vastly different than what we experience today. For instance, humans are good with natural probability. If it feels colder in the morning, you predict a cooler day. If the sky looks dark in the morning, you predict rain. Things seem to go together, and one thing leads to another. Children grow up, they don't grow down. We have a general understanding of natural laws, and this means that patterns make sense. We have a mental theory about how gravity works, and an understanding that the stars overhead change position in accordance with the seasons. Things are related. This leads to our transferring expectations about the natural world to things that aren't necessarily natural. A certain intuition where we feel a certain way, and we don't investigate further. Artificial probability, such as true randomness, creates problems for our thinking. True randomness rarely exists in nature and it is not something we have adapted to understand. Consider the first heuristic, which shows that in truly random events, we find patterns where there are no patterns. The Gambler's Fallacy. One night at the famous Monte Carlo Casino in Monaco, the roulette wheel landed on black 26 times in a row. With each spin, the chance of landing on a black number is approximately 50%, as it's the chance of landing on a red number. The chance is actually 18 out of 37, but we'll round it to 50% for the ease of calculations. On the roulette wheel, there are 18 red spaces, 18 black spaces, and a green space. If green comes up, both red and black lose. And this allows the casino to keep the odds in their favor. The odds in the casino are never 50-50. They are always stacked in favor of the casino. Getting black two times in a row would happen approximately one quarter of the time, and getting black eight times in a row would happen approximately four times in a thousand. Rare, but possible. Landing on black 26 times in a row is so rare, the chances are approximately one in 67 million. This is 0.5 times 0.5 26 times. What did the gamblers do? Once they saw a streak of over 10 black numbers in a row, they started betting on red, and they kept losing. They thought red and black would balance out, never understanding that with each spin of the wheel, the chances of black are 50%, and the chances of red are 50%. Chances are always 50%, no matter what color came up before. Many gamblers would crease, increase, keep increasing their bets on red, assuming that red would come up eventually. They lost millions of francs before finally red came up and many gamblers had gone broke or given up. This has been seen countless times where people look at true randomness and think they can sense a pattern. This horse has been winning a lot lately. It's got to lose eventually. I've been losing every game I've played. I'm due to win, so I'll bet some more. Both of these statements are based on the gambler's fallacy. There is no pattern in randomness. But since people are so good at spotting patterns in nature, we apply the same mental machinery to events that are truly random. 
There is a popular gambling technique that you bet on red and keep doubling your bets until it hits. The problem is, if you started with $10, if black were to come up eight times in a row, you would have lost over $2,000, and you may be nearing the betting limit. Each time the wheel spins, your odds are the same, no matter what came up before. The hot hand fallacy in basketball is like this. The hot hand fallacy is when a player is having a great game and they keep giving the player the ball, expecting them to continue to play at that level. However, a 60% shooter will always have a 60% chance of making the next shot. Consider the great Shaquille O'Neal. Though a perpetual all-star, he was particularly terrible at shooting free throws. He shot around 50%, while the league average was around 75%. If he made eight shots in a row, people might get excited and think he was on a streak. But his chances were still around 50% of hitting the next one. Even Shaq, who shot thousands of free throws, did hit 12 in a row at one time in his career. The probability of that? 4.5 in 10,000. Totally within the realm of statistical probability. He took over 5,000 free throws. Statistics are, streaks are statistically expected and do not indicate a change in overall performance. What makes this happen? It seems our natural ability to find patterns causes this. Many studies have found that people find patterns in random events. An fMRI study showed an area of the prefrontal cortex associated with identifying patterns was active when people were shown a random sequence. In a similar study, a researcher showed people random numbers and asked them to find a pattern, not telling them the numbers were random. The participants found patterns. And when the researcher told them the numbers were randomly generated, the participants argued that there were, indeed, patterns in the numbers. We can't just shut off our natural processes, even when we know they're wrong. Our evolutionary ancestors had to be attentive to patterns in the environment around themselves, looking for clues to help them find food sources, and safe shelter. The Availability Heuristic We believe that ideas that come to mind easily must be important. Whether or not this is actually true, it is how we behave. Consider how prejudice works and is fed by the media. If you have little experience with a particular ethnic group, it is common to develop prejudices about that group. Let's consider a scenario with a made-up group, Lilliputians. You have never met one, but you've seen them on the news. The news that comes to mind most easily are things that are frightening. You are less likely to remember news stories about charity work, and more likely to remember news stories about crime. So when you think of Lilliputians, you may think of crime stories and develop negative attitudes about Lilliputians, even if Lilliputians are less likely to commit crimes than the average population. If you have little experience with an ethnic minority, the negative traits stand out more than the positive ones. This means that we are more likely, in general, to see the world as a dangerous place. Because things that affect our emotions and make us fearful are more likely to be remembered. The availability heuristic also means that we can make incorrect judgments because some things are easier to recall than others. If you asked how much your roommates clean compared to how much you clean, most people would overestimate how much they clean and underestimate how much their roommates clean. It is so much easier to think of our actions than the actions of someone else. But because our own actions come to mind easily, we believe they are more common. The halo effect. Are attractive people kinder? Are wealthy people more knowledgeable? The answer to both of these questions is an obvious no. But if you look at how we are influenced by attractive people in advertisements and by wealthy people in politics, it does seem like we are giving them credit for more than they deserve. The halo effect means that if someone is good at one thing, we expect them to be good at other non-related things. It might seem odd, but consider how powerful first impressions are. If you have the opportunity to show off a skill when meeting someone, they will, you will likely have a high, they will likely have a high overall opinion of your abilities. Skill in that one area will transfer to areas where you have not demonstrated any ability. Of course, we can't look like we're trying too hard. 
So if you're really good at putt-putt, it can be difficult to demonstrate. It would be awkward to always invite people to a putt-putt course. The heuristic is usually discussed in terms of attractiveness because of how easily attractiveness draws our attention. Even babies prefer to look at traditionally attractive faces. If you're like Derek Zoolander and really, really ridiculously good looking, you don't have to work very hard to show that off. Keats wrote, beauty is truth, truth is beauty, as if it is obvious. Surely we can trust someone who's attractive to know what kind of facial cleanser we should buy. Confirmation bias. Do you remember Stephen Colbert's satirical show, The Colbert Report? The premise of the show was making fun of a close-minded right-wing commentator who bullies and insults his guests. The show was popular with people who consider themselves liberal. It was also popular with people who consider themselves conservatives. The liberals thought Colbert was making fun of conservatives, and the, but Colbert took the part so seriously that conservatives enjoyed how his character would insult his liberal guests. Confirmation bias is the reason that two people who believe completely different things can see the same media and each believe the media is supporting their own beliefs. Both people might look at the other person as misguided or ignorant because they each have an automatic mental process that dismisses information that conflicts with their beliefs and pays close attention to information that supports their beliefs. We all have this process. Even people who are aware of this bias have to pay close attention to avoid being influenced about it. Think about what people call fake news. Some people use the term to dismiss anything they don't agree with. Perhaps you have a relative on social media that shares stories that you are sure are not true. And that same person gets annoyed when you share a story that has objective truth to it. It's easy to dismiss things that go against our beliefs. And in a world filled with misinformation, we must be vigilant to check facts and the source of information. The representative heuristic. Representativeness is a large category that includes the base rate fallacy, the conjunction fallacy, and ignorance of sample size. The representative heuristic specifically refers to making judgments based on how similar something is to a general group. If a toddler is quiet, reserved, and likes drawing, people may believe that child will grow up to be an artist, even though many toddlers are quiet, reserved, and like drawing, and few of them become artists. People prefer lottery tickets that have numbers that appear spaced out, like 7, 16, 21, 33, and 46, rather than numbers like 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, even though both sequences have the same chance of winning. Some people argue that a single cold winter means global warming is not real, in the same way that some people argue that a single hot summer is strong evidence for global warming. The base rate fallacy is about making a judgment that fails to take into account the actual likelihood of something. A classic example is to ask people how dangerous various occupations are. Compare mining machine operators and waste management workers. Who is more likely to get killed on the job? When people answer this question, they often consider the mining machine operators even though waste management workers are four times as likely to die on the job. The availability heuristic means it is easier to bring to mind mining accidents because they are reported in the news, while waste, while waste management accidents are far more common. We ignore things that are common and pay attention to things that are not. In addition, the deaths of mining machine operators is extremely rare. There are fewer than 15,000 people employed in that industry and over 450,000 people employed in trash collection. Which means the death of mining machine operators is news, but the death of a waste management worker is not. The conjunction fallacy is a logical problem where people judge by representativeness and end up choosing less likely options. 
The classic question Kahneman and Tversky asked was about Linda. They were told facts about Linda as a college student, where she was described as an activist, and then asked to make judgments about Linda, including asking about whether it was more likely that Linda was a bank teller or that Linda was a bank teller who was active in the feminist movement. Many people say it is more likely that Linda is a bank teller who is active in the feminist movement rather than just a bank teller. Why is this a mistake? Look at the image with the two spaces marked by A and B. A represents all bank tellers, and B represents bank tellers who are also active in the feminist movement. Since bank tellers who are active in the feminist movement are also bank tellers, A is always more likely than B, because if B is true, so is A. However, if A is true, B may not be true. People make the same error if asked about whether which is more likely, an earthquake in the United States or an earthquake in Southern California. An earthquake in Southern California might sound more likely, but it is B in the image, and the United States is A. Ignorance of sample size refers to the fact that people will often ignore the size of the sample when interpreting results. This is a complicated concept that deals with experimental design and variability within a population. Since experimental design is already difficult for people to grasp, it makes sense that this can lead to errors in understanding experimental results. The key concept here is variability. Many human traits have a great deal of variability. For instance, you can ask who was more likely to get into top colleges, students from small high schools or students from large high schools. We know there are benefits to smaller schools, but it turns out that those benefits have to do with students feeling more connected to the school, not necessarily with academic performance. Smaller schools show no difference than larger schools on average, but taken individually, some small school students perform worse than students from large schools, and in some small schools, students perform better. The reason is sample size. Small, since small schools have fewer students, the motivation of a handful of students can vastly skew results. Consider a school where the average height is 68 inches. If you take a sample of 10 students and one of those students is very tall or very short, it can have a large impact on the average height. If you take a large sample, an outlier has a smaller effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect means that most that the most incompetent people overestimate their ability the most. The most competent people underestimate their ability. There are two things people get wrong in their understanding of this effect. First, they think that the least knowledgeable people believe they are more competent than the most knowledgeable people. This is not true. The most knowledgeable people know they are more competent than the least knowledgeable people, but they still underestimate their competence. In the graph, the green and red lines represent perceived ability, and the gray line represents actual ability. On the x-axis, at the bottom, we see that those in the bottom quartile estimate their ability as lower than the top quartile. However, their estimate is much higher than their actual ability. Well, those in the top, top quartile know they are knowledgeable, but still underestimate their ability. Second, this effect applies to everyone. Whatever is your area of expertise, you underestimate your ability. And where you know little, you overestimate your ability. Looking at the chart again, we see that the range in estimation is low, meaning that those who know little believe they know nearly as much as those who know a lot. Talking heads on TV will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with experts, and those who control the microphone win. We see loudness can be competence, partly due to the false confidence of the ignorant person. Anchoring. In negotiations, should you speak first or second? Often people are told to wait for an offer before saying what they want. This can work to your advantage, but you have to be ready to walk away from a lowball offer. The reason is when a number is abnormally high or low, it is difficult to get away from that number. Anchoring has been shown 
to influence human behavior by giving us a false starting place. If you are on a jury where the outcome is unclear, whoever speaks first will have an immense amount of influence. Let's say out of 12 jury members, three are convinced of a guilty verdict and one is convicted, convinced of an innocent verdict, while the other eight are undecided. If the person who is convinced of the innocent verdict is the first one to give their opinion in the jury room, those eight undecideds are more likely to lean not guilty. Kahneman has shown many examples of this, but the places he shows so-called experts thrown off by anchoring are the most interesting. Real estate agents and appraisers were shown houses with abnormally high or low prices and asked what they think the actual price should be. For instance, two groups were shown the same house, but sometimes the price was high above normal and sometimes the price was far lower than normal. The agents and appraisers stated that they would ignore the listed price and only consider the traditional factors in assessing value, such as neighborhood, size, and curb appeal. However, those that saw a house with an abnormally high price valued it higher than those that saw it with an abnormally low price. The listed price served as an anchor that was hard to get away from. We can also consider the influence this might have on physicians who are asked for a second opinion. Once another physician has made a diagnosis, it is incredibly difficult for a new physician to change that diagnosis. Regression to the mean. In Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, he states that the statistician David Friedman used to say that if the topic of regression comes up in a criminal or civil case, the side that must explain regression to the jury will lose the case. The heuristic is likely the most complex and misunderstood because it requires us to go against our natural expectation of patterns. For instance, we know that animals are born small and get larger. If a puppy weighed 8 pounds and now weighs 10 pounds, we expect its weight to be at least 10 pounds next week. I have literally heard students try to explain statistical regression when asked what regression to the mean is. The terms are related, but vastly different. Regression to the mean explains differences in your own performance. We don't expect you to perform exactly the, the same every time, but we expect you to perform similarly in your usual performance. With regression to the mean, we are considering human performance. Remember the hot hand fallacy from the gambler's fallacy? If an average player has a great game, we might expect their next game to be great. And yet, in their next game, the player returns to form, playing at an average level. If that same player has a terrible game, we might expect them to continue to be terrible. It is possible the player has an injury, or just recovered from an injury, that influenced their performance. But in most cases, it is simply regression to the mean. If you were offered the chance to coach a football team, and that team had a great year the previous year or a bad year the previous year, which one should you choose? Most people would prefer the team with the great year. But if you look at teams that have surprisingly good years and their performance the next year goes down, and teams that have surprisingly bad years generally show an improvement in performance. Commentators try to explain performance while it's happening but discussing probabilities is much less interesting than talking about individual players that bring a team down or inspirational coaches that get the best out of their players. If the team you coach improves, you get credit. If the team you coach performs worse, you get the blame. It is too hard to explain regression to the mean, and people aren't going to understand it anyway. If you normally get B's on tests, and you get an A on a test, what do you expect to score on the next test? Did you suddenly get smarter? Did you start studying more? Or was it simply random chance? The idea is that we see natural variability in performance as indicating change has occurred, rather than simply being natural variability in performance. If your grade went way up or way down and you didn't do anything differently, then you can expect to regress to the mean. Before you get excited about an A, be sure you've really made a change in your studying, or that the tests aren't surprisingly easy. Otherwise, your performance in the next test will likely disappoint you.
Thank you.